Hey everyone, it's Dr. Lee from Your Vet Online, and tonight we are going to talk all about dementia in pets. So that's right. It's um it's one of those things that we are starting to recognize a lot more of. And I thought I would go over tonight the signs that um, we should be looking out for with our pets, whether they're a cat or a dog. Um, we're also going to look at what causes it and some of the things that you can do at home to help your pets because there are actually quite a few things that you can do that will help slow down the progression of uh, dementia. Now, I guess it's a little bit like us. We've... Um, I don't know about you guys, but sometimes you might get lost for words. You are thinking about something mid-sentence, la, 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 can't forget what you're talking about. And actually, a similar thing starts to happen with our pets. And so if you're watching, I would love you all to go and carry on watching all to the very end because... I have got a questionnaire that I want to be able to uh, give to you so that you can go out, fill it out, and just check your own animals and make sure that they are um, not suffering from dementia. Because if we can get onto this quickly, then what we can do is actually help to prevent the uh, damaging effects for a lot longer. So make sure you carry on and keep watching till the very end and I'll give you the link to get that uh, questionnaire so that you can check out your pets yourselves and you don't need to necessarily, um, you, you can work out straight away whether you've got a problem with your animal or not. Righty ho, I see we've got a couple of people watching. So I'll just let everyone know who I am. I'm Dr. Lee and if you've just joined us, I'm from Your Vet Online, and we're a company that basically provides you guys, the animal owners, with 24 7 animal health advice from real veterinarians. So that's right, whether it's day or night, we're available 24 7 to answer your questions. So you can just pop on over. We have a website, which I'll pop that just down there it's www.yourvetonline.com. And you can ask your questions any time, day or the night. We're right there for you. Okay, so let's start getting onto the good stuff and gets, gets back to talking about dementia. So how many of you have a cat or a dog who might be about eight years old or a little bit older than eight years old? Because some of the latest research has shown that Eight years old is the sort of tipping point, and that fourteen percent of pets over the age of that, of eight years old, are actually saying to show signs of dementia. Now, I'm not saying that they're necessarily really badly affected, but there are signs there. So we need to start doing things with those pets to try and halt the progression of the disease. So if you've got a pet that's starting to show some signs, what put in the comments down below what sort of signs you're seeing and we'll have a bit of a chat and we'll work out whether that's necessarily a sign of dementia or whether it could be something else. So when we talk about cognitive disease and dysfunction in animals, it's kind of like Alzheimer's disease disease in humans and the changes in the brain basically caught a result of neural dysfunction and amyloid putting little tiny plaques in the brain which then sometimes cause little micro bleeds and when this happens of course it leads to a little bit of brain damage now the big thing is is how do we actually diagnose dementia because ultimately dementia is a diagnosis of exclusion because we can't actually see these changes 
probably <laughs> unless we actually do post-mortem exams and we're not going to do that to a human or a um, or one of our pets I mean, yes, we can definitely go and do MRIs and we can see changes in the activity levels in certain parts of the brain. But ultimately, the diagnosis um, is pretty much based on exclusion of other things. So some of the things that we often see when we um, have dementia, I'm just trying to get my little things up here so like you can see what I'm talking about. So we use an acronym called DISHA. Now this is basically, what well, helps me remember it as well, I love little acronyms and basically these acronyms um, are related to the signs that you might see in your pet. Now it doesn't matter whether you've got a cat or a dog, these signs are still relevant for either one. And I see we've got a few more viewers here, so just make sure you listen to the very end because I've got a little questionnaire for everybody um, that I'll give you the link for later. And basically that questionnaire, you can fill it, it asks you a whole lot of questions about your pet, and then when you, each question has a number attached to it, and when you add them all up at the end, we can see whether your pet has some of the risk factors that they're actually got signs that they might have a little bit of cognitive dysfunction or dementia. But anyway, so I just wanted to pop that out there just while everyone's listening and watching. And if you've got any questions, make sure you just pop them down below and we can answer those as we go. So let me see here. Let's go back to our disha, our signs of cognitive dysfunction. So the first thing we've got is D, and that goes for disorientation. So we all have seen our pets sometime, you know, the old animal or the older animal that is struggling to know where they actually are. They might um, be thinking, oh, where am I? And that's disorientation. So if your pet is doing that, that's one of the classical signs that they might be suffering from this. I stands for social interaction. Now, with dementia and cognitive dysfunction, a lot of these pets, they either go from one extreme to the other. So they may become either really clingy and not want to leave your side. And some people will think and call this separation anxiety. And it is a type of separation anxiety, but it's something related to the changes that have occurred in the brain due to old age. The other thing is sometimes the animals just change totally and they don't even want to talk to you anymore and they don't want to hang out and pretty much show, show no interest in you anymore. So those are the ones which, you know, it can be a bit sad because you want cuddles and you used to always have a very cuddly cat or dog and the next minute they're like, go away, I don't want to talk to you. So that can be a very big um, indicator that something's going on. And remember, it can be subtle. A lot of these signs start off very, very subtle. And when I give that indication of that 14% uh, um, of animals at eight, um, over eight years old, uh, um, at eight years old, sorry, that show signs, these signs might be just very subtle signs. So it could be that you, you originally think, oh, they're getting a little bit more independent or, oh gosh, they really just don't like going outside into the cold. But it actually could be that they don't want to leave you or they are showing those, you know, sort of signs with change in social interaction. So the S part of Disha, that's for the sleep cycle. So with this sleep, I guess, is one of those problems that we hear a lot about as veterinarians. Because I, when people start to, well, my own dog did it actually, um, Pippa, she would wake me up dreadfully, like five, six times a night, and it wasn't for any particular reason, you know. So she, I thought she was wanting to go to the toilet in the early stages, 
as her um, sort of dementia got worse, I really realised, well, yeah, it had to be dementia. And it was, I was kind of like a mean mum. I ended up putting her in the garage. She was very warm and comfy. She didn't have any problems. But then I didn't realise actually how much sleep deprived I actually was. Having a dog that was getting me up so much, I was pretty much like a... Um, a mother with a new baby. So, yeah, sleep deprivation um, can be big time with these animals. So it could be that they're um, waking multiple times during the night or on the reverse flip side, these dogs and cats could be just sleeping forever and really quite unrousable sometimes. So we've got... D for disorientation, we've got I for um, the social interaction, we've got S for sleep cycles, we're on to H, and H is for house soiling. And this is another major problem that I hear about all the time as a veterinarian, and I'm sure many of my colleagues do too, because this is where we've got to work, work out, is it a primary problem with something else? And I'll go on to that a little bit later. Or is it a case that actually they have memory loss, so they've forgotten where their toilet is, so like they have a decline in their learning ability, um, oh, sorry, memory, or have they, yeah, they're just not sure where they're going. So toilet... Um, Changes in their behaviour related to their toileting can be very big. And for cats and dogs that are kept inside, this can be very stressful for you. Um, I mean, I know there's nothing worse than a dog that wants to go in and out and in and out, or a cat for that matter. So that could be one of the little signs. Okay, so our first A, because Disha has actually got two A's. So A, the first A, is for a change in activity. So this could be that they're doing lots of circling. They could be just walking aimlessly, like they're on a mission, but it just keep they keep on walking. It could also be the complete opposite where they just don't want to do anything. And that can be combined with the sleep problem. So a lot of dogs I've seen in the past, I had a friend's uh, golden retriever actually, she was a beautiful dog, but as she got older, she started to just wander aimlessly around and around the house. And with that, she also vocalised, which isn't fun for anyone because it's, yeah, it's loud and it just keeps on going and she didn't really know where she was. So... Yeah, that's what we mean by like a change in activity. And then the next A as part of Disha is a change in anxiety level. So your pet for their whole entire life may have been completely fine with thunder and lightning and fireworks then all of a sudden, it seems like, you know, they've turned 12 years old and they are petrified. So, again, Pippa, my dog, I'm positive she had dementia. I've diagnosed it on her. And this was the perfect example because she never had a problem with guns, fireworks, thunder, lightning, anything like that. But as she got older and sort of was around that sort of 11, 10, 11 year, years old, um, she did have issues with those things and she became very anxious. So it could be that if your pet is suddenly showing new fears and it could be even any sort of loud noise, like suddenly they're scared of the vacuum cleaner or they don't like music being played, um, you know, they might have put up with your heavy metal rock and the next minute they play, you start playing that and, and they're howling the house down. And it's not because it's too loud, it's because their brain has got some dysfunction. So, yeah, the signs, we try and use these signs to rule 
rule in issues and to rule out issues. So we want the more that of these signs that we see, the more um, likely that we've got a problem with cognitive dysfunction. And I guess as you can tell from all of this, is that you guys actually play a massive role in actually helping us vets to diagnose this problem. Um, I would love you all to just keep a diary. I love diaries for pet owners because, you know, like tonight, for example, it's absolutely freezing out there. We have got thunder and lightning happening. Now, if your dog has never shown a sign of being scared of thunder and lightning, but tonight it did, then you might just write in the diary, what's the date? 19th of June, had thunder and lightning, um, Pippa will use her. Pippa was very, very scared. And so when you go to visit your veterinarian for a clinical exam, then you can whip out your diary, flick it through before you go and just say, OK, we had this. And actually, oh, actually, I've had five cases in the last six months where my dog has actually been scared and she never used to be scared before. So that's a really good way of helping us vets because unfortunately, some vets also won't, well, they'll forget to ask you how your animal's behaving. And we aren't, yeah, sometimes this happens. So you also have to be, um, yeah, I guess it's like being with an older person. You have to, um, what's the word? Ha, huh, there you go, I might have dementia. No, um, but you, you have to be someone that, brings these things up with your veterinarian in case we miss it or we forget to ask. Okay, so let's just have a little look-see. I'm just going to have a look here because I've got some figures. Oh, yes. So the figures that, they actually shocked me. So I think if you saw me, I wrote um, a little comment about um, with dogs over 13 years of age, 100% of them are showing signs of some sort of dementia. I'm not saying these dogs are necessarily really, really bad, but they're showing signs. So 100%. Now, the scary thing is, is dogs that are eight years old are showing, 14% of those are showing signs of um, dementia. And what a very scary thing is, is that Mild signs are missed in 87% of dogs. And so that means that these animals are deteriorating a lot faster than they would if we actually started um, changing their diet, putting them on certain supplements, and giving them much more brain enrichment. And I'll make sure I go over that shortly with you as well. So... I've been doing a little bit of research for you guys and what I've come across with a lot of these specialists that are the specialists in veterinary medicine and neurology and behavior now actually recommend that you have um, that our geriatrics have vet checks every six months and I mean I know that's going to be like oh god every six months but I would be keeping my diary and if you're starting to notice things happen then it's more of a reason for you to go back to your vet and discuss it and start getting your pet on some um, of the, pro the, the um, medica well, they're not really medica, well, they're kind of medications, medications, diet, supplements, that sort of thing, to help slow the progression. Because as you know, just like with people and humans, we can't actually treat this disease and stop it in its tracks. All we can do is prevent things at this stage, but you never know. We have a lot of very smart people in this world who are a lot smarter than me, and they, um, yeah, they'll probably work out some way of fixing it all. But anyway, with these, why they're saying this is there's some data that shows that 50% of dogs have a change in their in that DISHA questionnaire that we use, 50% have changed in six months. 
and 70 percent have changed after a year so that goes to show that there is actually quite a change in our dogs and it happens quickly and and the re there's been a lot of research in dogs there's not quite the same research in cats unfortunately but a lot of this when I've done my reading a lot of it is comparable so um, the neurologists and the behaviorists are saying that um, we can apply the same ideas with cats so when I talk about dogs don't think I'm being catist <laughs> So yeah, now I've had a few people ask whether there's actually a breed or a sex um, pre the election. So um, a lot of the, when you go through the studies, a lot of them will say, you know, more males or more females in this one and, and that one, or it's this breed seems to be more sensitive, that sort of thing. When you actually put all the studies together, and we call that a meta-analysis, they actually even all out. So there's pretty much, we don't have to worry that there's certain breeds that might get it more often or certain, um, you know, sex or anything like that. So cool, cool down there. We don't have to worry about that, which is good. Um, but what we do know is that the biggest risk factors are age and diet. So as I just said to you before about age, we do know that after eight years old, we do start to see um, the signs of our, the, our pet's brains deteriorating. Now, the interesting thing is about the diet. And I think this is pretty cool because um, I think the similar things have been found in humans too. Well, actually, a lot of this, it's all a bit comparable because of, of quite a few of the studies, they actually do the studies on the dogs and then they replicate. And so it's kind of cool that we, we're sort of following a similar sort of thing. But anyway, there's been um, a study that showed when beagles were fed a therapeutic diet versus just a normal running your mill commercial diet and unfortunately it didn't say what that was so I don't know how um, how good that diet was but basically the dogs that were fed the special therapeutic diet were three times less likely to have cognitive dysfunction than the ones that were fed the just the normal diet and we also know that a diet that's basically made up of scraps you know table scraps and a bit of this and a bit of that is not very good either so it's quite interesting um, we you know we might be all good until we reach a certain age but then as signs start changing it, it goes to show like in some ways I mean, this is such a new thing, guys. Like, we don't know everything about it yet. But I do think that if you're, as our pets age, we should really be looking at feeding them mature, um, age-appropriate diets. And um, these, these diets that they've been making that have, that we are specific for, um, brain dysfunction and brain disease and cognitive dysfunction, whatever you want to call it, they've been enriched with substances like omega-3, L-carnitine, antioxidants, um, here's my little list here, arginine, medium chain triglycerides, and these together and I have to stress this because this was really stressed in a lot of the papers that I wrote, um, read is that it's not the individual components, it's the additive um, and the combinations that give the benefit. So you can't necessarily just say, oh, I'll just go and feed some fish oil and she'll be right. Because it might not, hey, that's gonna have beautiful effects for other things, but it might not necessarily work specifically to improve brain function 
to the best of its ability if it doesn't have those other um, other supplements with it at the same time. So yeah, we we just need to be a little bit wary about that. Now I do know, and I don't like plugging products or anything like that usually on here, but because this is kind of a new thing, um, we well it's not new new, but it's kind of new. Um, we do have Hills have a brain diet, and Purina has put out a diet called NeuroCare. Now. I went looking to see if NeuroCare was actually in Australia and I cannot seem to find it. So maybe it's not here yet, but there have been some pretty cool, um, good work done on that one in, over, over in the US and Slovakia and some other places. Um, and interestingly, the NeuroCare diet has actually helped dogs with epilepsy. So where they've actually um, improved, which is kind of cool. So it's very, it's, it's pretty exciting to have diets that we can use in a way that's like medication. And I mean, I know that human um, health is moving this way too. So it's all very, very interesting. There are heaps of supplements on the market and as I said before, the main issue is unless the whole supplement has got some data behind it, um, we don't know, um, yeah, is it actually going to work? So it could be, you know, you might think, oh, I'll give it some vitamin E, I'll give it some fish oil, I'll give it some L-carnitine. We'll be right, we'll sprinkle that on top of our our biscuits or our raw meat or whatever you're feeding. Well, it might not do anything because it's the combination that gives, well, I like to say it's the combination that makes the medicine. So, yeah. So just be a little bit wary about marketing. And I know a few of you know that I get a little bit grumpy sometimes with some of the marketing that we see out there because um, they get, can be confusing. And um, you have to read through a lot of stuff to actually work out what's good or not. Right. And then the next thing that we all know from us humans as well is enrichment. And, hey, we should all be getting our pets to do the crossword, basically. No. <laughs> but just like our brains, if you don't use it, you lose it. And that's what's happening with our pets as well. So it's really important to be getting our pets' brains healthy by providing them with things to do and to help them be active. And it doesn't necessarily have to be active in a, in a physical way because a lot of our pets have other problems. So they might have arthritis. You know, they might have diabetes. They might have kidney disease. Uh, these are all common or heart disease. You know, these are all common problems as pets get older. So it might they might not be as mobile as they used to be, but they can still use their brain. So what can we do? We can have feeders, special feeders that might um, help them. You know, they have to little what we call them puzzle feeders basically you hide biscuits or bits of meat in different areas and they have to go look for it you might hide if your pet's a little bit more mobile you can hide bits and pieces um, of food around the house that might help or in the backyard you know if you've got a dog you might like to give them some treats that they have to go maybe dig underneath something or yeah just keep Keep their brain active. And there's lots of little games that you can play. There's some cool games that, um, feeder games that you can see on the internet, on YouTube. You just pop it. I, I love the one with the the old lemonade bottles and you put the biscuits in the lemon, and this is for the dogs, and the dog spins it and it goes around and they have to spin it and then the biscuits fly out and they love it. Even in the summertime, you might um, make ice blocks for your pets. You might think that's not 
that's just keeping them cool, but it also is a little bit of enrichment. It's different for them. So it's something that that's making their brain stimulated. Um, even having things like water fountains for cats. Cats love to drink running water and it's just, they, can, they might just sit there and play in it. And that's enrichment. So it's keeping our cats and our dogs' brains active. And there's things like, I know that you can get the iPad with um, games, you know, with the, the, the mouse running everywhere. That's kind of cool too. So, you know, you might, um, you might look at giving your cat some games like that. So, yeah, it's all these little things. They all add up and, you know, help prevent and slow down the progression of disease. So if we go on and we talk about the prevention of dementia, dementia, I guess the thing that we've got to think about is once our animals hit eight years old, we're, we're starting to see changes. So we want to start to um, visit your vet more regularly make sure that you don't just leave it but keep a diary you want to keep a diary so we know exactly what's going on and the frequency with what things are happening so just so that we can be sure and don't forget to ask your vet about it either like don't expect them um, necessarily to ask so it's up to you just as much to um, yeah to be thinking about this because um, some vets will just forget to ask also consider utilizing a brain diet of some sort um, and supplements. And there's also medications that we can use too. So if you get my, let me see here, I'll just pop this up. If you're, um, the link that you see at the top um, on the page now, that will take you through to get a questionnaire um, that you can get a guide about your pet and whether you, they might be suffering or starting to see some of those early signs of dementia. So if you click on that, so, well, yes, you won't be able to click on it, but yourvetonline.com, does my pet have dementia? If you look at that, then you can fill out that form and just see what's going on and what state they're in. You can then either have a consult with us, we can discuss the needs of your pet, take that sheet with you to your own veterinarian and discuss what they might need. Because there are, we do, I didn't really go into this before, but when we look at this as well, some of the reasons why our cats and dogs might show some of the symptoms is because they have other diseases going on as well or instead of so it might not be dementia at all it could be the the cats having trouble and um is house soiling a lot and you're you're thinking it's dementia but actually it could be that they've got arthritis and they can't get into their kitty litter box anymore or they're just too sore and crockety and, yeah, don't want to move. Um, same could be said at this time of year when the pets are, you know, it's cold weather down here in the southern hemisphere and it's absolutely freezing. And so if you've got a cat or dog that's really struggling with arthritis, then they might not get up as much. You know, they might spend all day in the cold, like all cuddled up and don't want to move. So it might not be dementia. So if you fill out that form, definitely do that and take a look. You can It will guide you through what you might have going on and what might not be going on. And then basically contact your vet if you're concerned or you can contact us for a consult, yourvetonline.com. Right, let's see if there's any questions. Let me see. Oh, there's a few. Let me start at the beginning. Da, da, da. Oh, okay. Oh, no, there's just one. All right. So, Amy, she has asked, 
my cat often wants to be fed dinner seconds after he's just had it. Could this be an indicator or is this just him wanting more? Ah, he did have hypothyroidism, which has made him want so much more food, but is now under control with tablets. Okay. Hey, look, it could well be. I was just going to say, it sounds like he's probably got hypothyroidism. Um, the thing with this sort of thing, though, is usually the signs of um, wanting to eat more are usually decrease quite a lot if they are actually under control with tablets. So if the thyroid medication and his blood tests for his thyroid are looking pretty good, then yeah, it could be a sign that, hey, he might have forgotten that he's had dinner. So it's with that sort of situation, Amy, you're going to have to weigh up the whole picture. So um, yeah, it's not just, it's not just, um, it's a little bit different, but absolutely, I would, you know, get that, I'll, I'll pop it up again, I'd get the um, questionnaire and I would be looking at that and seeing if there's other signs, because remember, we want to see a few of the things and there might be some other signs that you notice when you read the questions and, you, and that stimulates you to think, oh, okay, that actually might be happening. So I will, um, yeah, we need to look at this a little bit more closely. I hope that helps. All right then, guys, is there anybody else with any questions? Otherwise, we'll leave it at that for tonight. I hope you enjoyed that one. Take a little read of the article. I'm going to write another one with a few more bits and pieces added to it. And, yeah, make sure you um, definitely download the little uh, questionnaire because that has a lot of great questions and it's basically what us vets use to help diagnose this problem and yeah as I said it's a di diagnosis of exclusion. All right then guys hope you enjoyed that thank you so much for listening I'll be back next Tuesday at 7 30 p.m Australian Eastern Standard Time. If you've got any ideas for topics pop them in the question in the comments below because I'm always after ideas so that I'm talking about what you guys want to know. Um, so yeah, definitely get in touch and um, let us know if you've got any ideas for topics because sometimes even, even though there's so much that we can talk about, sometimes I have massive brain laps. <laughs> so maybe I need to start more crosswords and brain food. And that might be my problem too. All right then, guys, you have a great week. Um, it's my birthday week this week. Yay. So anyways, um, so hopefully I might get have some fun times this week. Um, but other than that, I will catch you all next Tuesday. All right then, until then, we'll catch you later. Bye.